So, um, yeah, this evening I'm bringing you the story um, of the sad demise of Mary Bax. And when I first decided to bring you this story to you, I was afraid it would just be a brief story on the murder of a young woman many years ago with no pictures or much to say, really. However, as I researched the happenings of that day in August long, long time ago, I began to realise that, intriguingly, there were several quite specific versions of the story with a healthy sprinkling of local folklore mixed in. Of course, there is a true story amongst all of this, and I think I can shed some light on it for this evening. And I will return to the actual murder story in a little while, but firstly, a bit of background information. Sadly, Mary Back was murdered long before photography was around, so we can only imagine what she looked like. Uh, this picture gives us an idea of the clothes that were commonplace at the time for average people. We know she was only 23 years old, and I have found her several times described as beautiful. It appears she came from a good background, and we know her father was called John. And it's actually quite interesting seeing Wimpy say that, that she was a chambermaid in the Guildford Hotel, and I will actually look into that a little bit more. And I have a friend who's been trying to find more on ancestry, but she hasn't managed to find any details of the rest of her family and her mother as yet, but it's definitely a work in progress. So this is the road today. And I've read that Mary was from Deal, and I've read that Mary was from Sandwich. But it's almost certain that on that day that she was murdered, she was walking from Dill to Sandwich along the ancient highway. So this is the road today on a beautiful summer's evening and it passes between farmland and the golf course. In the late 1700s it was known as the Sand Hills and it was rough and desolate. A mixture of pasture land, boggy marshes, small waterways and dikes. And it's here that we come to some of the reasons, in my opinion, for the discrepancies. And that's Victorian melodrama. When Victorian culture was at its height and the likes of Wilkie Collins was famous, the old-fashioned story of a murder of a young long woman along a desolate highway by a penniless sailor must have really got the creative juices floating. After all, the story was already passing out of living memory. I have a time here to bring you all of the various works of fiction based on the murder, but briefly, this is the author Michael Ballantyne and his novel The Lifeboat, written in 1864. So obviously that is almost 100 years later, but like I said, what a brilliant story when they picked it up. In this work of fiction, Ballantyne has the murder taking place on the bleak sand hills one evening, with Mary being accosted and then murdered by a brutal foreign seaman. In this case, he was called Lascar, Martin Lascar. He goes on to say that Mary is buried where her stone stands. And I've actually found the book. You can buy the book online. It's actually been reprinted because obviously it's out of print being so old. But it was only quite cheap buying it on Amazon. And also you can get it on Kindle for free. So it, it, it is a good read anyway. And he just speaks a lot about this area, although obviously it is fiction. And a similar work of fiction, Mary Bax, A Tale Founded on Fact, was written by Thomas Mills and published in 1850 by the Penny Illustrated News. It tells a similar tale reminiscent of a torrid Victorian love story, Mary of Mary and some hopeful young man hoping to win her hand. And one is a Martin Lash, a foreigner from Spain who has lived in England for a while. And then finally, Clement William Scott, wrote in his book, Round About the Island, which he published in 1874. Um, this is an excerpt from the book, and it says, Our blood curdles in our veins, and we picture the murder on such a dreary night as this, and the shrieks of Mary Bax being carried out to sea over the salt sand hills. No help at hand, nothing to save her from the bludgeon of Martin Lash. And Scott said this was in, in 1792, to add even more confusion to the mix. So moving away from the heavily Victorian melodrama, the embellishments and the darkness, which we know comes from the fictional stories such as these, we have a parallel story that seems to be far more plausible. And it's well documented that Mary was murdered in the morning at around 10, 11 or 12 o'clock. And it seems she was walking to Sandwich carrying a bundle or a package 
and she had just passed what was then known as the halfway house, which was obviously now the Checkers. A former sailor who has been officially named as Martin Luss saw Mary and he tried to rob her and she argued and he murdered her. And the murder was witnessed by a looker's son. A uh, looker is a Kent colloquialism for shepherds. And the boy was known as Rogers. He was named Rogers. And it appears that he was 11 and 12 years old. And this is actually a picture of a cottage that was right by the checkers, just slightly up a little bit. And this is in Dill Library, this picture. And it shows the cottage, and, and I've read that it has foundations going back to the 17th century. So we can always be sure that this was there in Mary's day, and it does seem feasible that this would have been the cottage of the looker. So, the poor lad witnessed all of this, and he hid in the loose hay behind some stacks until the murderer was well on his way. And then he ran to Dill to raise the alarm. The townsfolk all ran to help, but it was too late for poor Mary, so they set about looking for her murderer instead. And it is said that he was found sleeping in Dover, but later reports say it was Folkestone, but by what I've read, it does seem to be Dover. And he was laying at the foot of a tombstone, still clutching the package that he had taken from Mary. And he was taken away and committed to St Dunstan's Jail in Canterbury to await his trial at the next Maid Saint Assizes. So, who was Martin Lars? and what do we know of him and his circumstances. All official documents name him as Lars, but as we've seen, works of fiction have renamed him several times, which is leading to the confusion on this story. But to shed a bit more light on him, we can look at this. Now I found this. Uh, this is a page from the Illustrated Police News of the 18th of November, 1888. So we're actually talking 90 years after the murder. But this is like a report on the murder. And this was a weekly illustrated newspaper, which is one of the earliest British tabloids. It features sensational and melodramatic reports and illustrations of murders and hangings. And it was a direct descendant of the execution broadsheet of the 18th century. And here's the report of the murder that took place over 100 years before, showing the only picture known of him. And it's at the top, you see the guy at the top, I have got another picture, but it's quite a long story. And it's telling the story of, of the murder and of what happened to him and who he was. And so it says Martin was born in Norway, in Bergen, and he was a seafaring man. And when a boy, he came to England in a Danish trading ship, deserting the service of his employer. He entered on board the, the British fleet and he served as naval seaman for several years, two of which was on board a ship called the Fame which had 74 guns. I also found this quotation from the Newgate calendar that appears in a brilliant blog about the murder written by Martin Charlton. And it may explain his circumstances at the time and that of many other former sailors who the country had no further use for. It says, in this culprit, we have another deplorable instance of dismissing seamen, often penniless at the end of the war, which they have often conquered. When foreigners enlist under our banners, having served our purpose, ought not the government at least to send them back to their own homes? But such traits of common justice are forgotten amid the more mighty concerns of our ministers. Where then, in such cases, is humanity beggar boon? And there he is. And as we can see, I mean, obviously, what we're reading there is, it's terrible. I mean, just as soon as we were... Um, finished with these poor sailors from wherever we'd got them from, we just dumped them on shore and expected them to to make their own way. And there is a, as I said, there's a long write up next to this, and um, it says that he showed no remorse, actually, quite the opposite. And um, the documents show he seemed cheerful and he mocked the court and insulted the witnesses. And when the guilty verdict was announced, he gave three loud cheers. And the judge was so alarmed at his behaviour that he ordered the prisoner to be chained to the floor of his cell. Now what I've got here is a part of that, and it's an excerpt of the write-up. 
but um, it it's the actual confession of, of him. So, is this the, the true Mary backstory? Because this is this is by the man himself. And it says, while well, chained to the floor of the jail, the prisoner was visited by religious people, and shortly before he was led to execution, he made the following confession. My name is Martin Nars and I am 27 years of age. I am a native of Bergen in Norway and I am a sailor. I have served under Lord Rodney in His Majesty's ship, the Fame, upwards of two years. Between 11 and 12 o'clock on Monday, the 25th of August last, as I was sitting on a bank near the halfway house between Savage and Dill, the deceased young girl, Mary Bax, passed by me on the road, upon which I soon afterwards got up and followed her after her. I let her get about half a mile from the halfway house and then I accosted her. I first said to her, which is the way to Sheerness? And she said, oh, you're a long way from Sheerness yet. I then said, am I? And she said, yes, that you are. I then said, well, I haven't got any money. And she then said, well, I haven't got any either. Then I said, well, I must have some from somewhere to bear my expenses. She replied, well, I have none to give you, I said. Well, I must have some, and soon after I pushed her into the ditch and then jumped in after her, up to the mud and waters, up to my middle. And then I took the bundle out of my hands and the shoes from her feet, and then I made off through the marshes to Dover. I threw the shoes away soon after getting out of the ditch, and the clothes I hid in a bush, near to the place where she was taken. I was told some years ago by an old Spaniard that I should commit the murder and that I should suffer for it. And I thought that was quite odd. So somebody's obviously, there was like a premonition that somebody had had and they'd like told him. So whether or not that, that led him to do it, or I don't know, it might have just been the desperation. He said the, the prisoner was then pinioned and drawn to the place of execution on Gallows Hill at Pendleton Heath. And during his journey there, which occupied half an hour, he manifested signs of sorrow and repentance. So that's the only time that he did that when he was actually on his way to get executed. So what was Mary? Um, it is said that her friends and family raised the money for a memorial stone, but Mary wasn't actually buried there as it isn't consecrated ground and it was only um, people that obviously committed crimes that was um, not buried in consecrated ground. But the son has led people in the past to believe she was because it is in the shape of a gravestone. But this is St Peter's Church in Sandwich and actually she was buried here. Um, the graves, I don't know if she ever had a gravestone, but the, the stones have been moved out of the way now anyway. But the burial register does show, we've got, got a bit of a, no, can you go back? Can you get that back up again? We have got a picture of the, if, it, if we haven't got it, it doesn't matter. But um, we should have a picture, but if not, does, it doesn't matter. But that's obviously Mary's stone. Have we got a picture of the burial register? No. No, don't worry. And then, um, obviously this is interesting anyway, because in this, in the here, it, it's another contradiction. Because on the stone, and this is a, a direct repeat of the stone, and it says that she was killed in 1782. But the actual burial register of the church, which we can really go by, I think, says 1783. So it says, on this spot, in August the 25th, 1782, Mary Back Spinster was murdered by Martin Lash, a foreigner who was executed for the same. So as I said, I think it would definitely be safer to go with the church burial record to ascertain the correct date. Um, but we can only guess it must have been an error on the part of the stone mason carving the wrong year. But like we said, with Wimpy's story and the other stories and the Victorian melodrama thrown in, it just goes to show that how through the passage of time, local folklore, um, mistakes in documenting and works of fiction blending with fact, that the, tr the true story of Mary Bax will never truly be known. But thank you. Hi folks, I hope you enjoyed the video. Finally, I'd like to say a huge thanks to all of the History Project sponsors. Without your continued support, none of the good work we do would even be possible. So thank you.